Hello again. In the next two videos, we will learn how to measure the GDP using the expenditure and income approaches. How complex are these calculations? Not quite, but in order to go ahead with them, we need to know the major components of the GDP and the income and expenditure flows among the four major sectors of an economy. Any suggestion which these sectors are? In every economy, we have households, firms, the government, and the foreign sector, which we collectively refer to as the rest of the world. And which are the three principal markets where these sectors interact? We have the financial markets, the market for factors of production, and the goods market. Let's provide some additional details for each of the three. The financial markets are where borrowing and lending of funds between all participants happens. When households save money, they use deposits or other saving instruments offered by the banking system. In this way, funds flow into the financial markets where businesses raise debt or equity capital to support their operations. Governments usually borrow from the financial markets, for example, through repurchase agreements. In terms of the foreign sector, there is an active transfer of funds from and to the rest of the world. So for each country, we're able to calculate a net foreign borrowing lending indicator. Good. Next, let's focus on the market for factors of production. Households and firms are the major players there. And what are the main factors of production? Do you remember? Yes, that's right. Capital, labor, land, and materials that are used in the standard manufacturing processes. As a result of firms' operations, income is generated and part of it flows back from businesses to individuals or back to households in the form of salaries paid. This all might sound a bit unclear at this point. Don't worry, though. We will connect all the dots further down the line. Let's focus on households now. They spend part of their income on consumption on the goods market. For our analysis, we will denote the consumer spending on final goods and services with capital C. Out of their total income, households also pay taxes to governments. As we know, what's left after that is accumulated and deposited to financial markets in the form of savings. S stands for household savings here. On the other side, government's net income consists of taxes received from households less the spending governments make on the market for final goods and services. G stands namely for government spending. In the case of any shortage of funds, Governments are borrowing from where? From the financial markets, of course. Good. Next, we will concentrate on the trade and capital flows involving the rest of the world. Usually, we are interested in the net exports figure, which reflects the difference between the value of goods and services sold to foreigners, or exports, X, and the purchases from other countries, or imports, M. Foreign countries are another principal player on the market for goods and services. And the last major participant in a given economy, companies, or the business sector. The funds firms raise from the financial markets, plus the capital and labor resources they receive from the factor market, allow them to produce goods and services. Part of the income generated is invested in the goods market in the form of capital goods, also known as property, plant, and equipment. Besides that, the business sector also needs machines and tools to build productive capacity so they buy these from the goods market. The investments in capital goods are usually denoted by I. Please pay attention that the expenditures made by companies only are considered here. Individuals do not play a role when it comes to investments. We said that capital goods are one example, but we need to mention that any changes in inventories also generate productive capacity for firms. Hence, when we see the term investments, or I, we must bear in mind that all property, plant, and equipment purchased by firms and the increase in inventory levels are its major components. In return, the revenue received by firms from the goods market is the sum of total household consumption, investments, government spending, and net exports. Pay attention that investments flow from and back to firms as companies produce the capital goods needed, sell them on the goods market, and receive income in return. Great. Please take some time to understand and remember these income, expenditure, and capital flows. The blue lines show the direction of expenditure on final goods and services. The flows of factors of production are in gray, and the financial flows like income, savings, and taxes are marked in red. 
Now, with all this information in mind, let's focus on measuring the GDP using the expenditure approach. The formula to be used here is exactly the same as the one we have just derived as a flow towards firms. As per the expenditure approach, the GDP is equal to the total consumption spending on final goods and services, plus investments in capital equipment and inventories, plus government spending, plus exports, minus imports. This is how we get the total market value of all final goods and services produced within the economy in a given period of time, which is basically the definition of GDP as per the expenditure approach. Households consumption on final goods and services is one of the major components of the total output of a country. Investment in capital goods and inventories is the second one. This is the most volatile component of the GDP measurement, as it is very sensitive to the ups and downs of the business cycles in the economy. However, there cannot be economic growth without a substantial amount of investments, right? Look at countries that are experiencing an increase in the production of goods and services. Investments there are a significant part of the GDP. For example, in India and China, they account for more than 30% of the GDP. In the USA and the European Union, 20% of the GDP is comprised of investments. The third component of the total output is the amount of government spending on final goods and services, or G. This is when governments invest in public goods and services, such as the construction of roads, schools, or spending on services such as police, military, and postal services. Foreign spending is the last piece when measuring GDP using the expenditure approach. It includes exports minus imports in a given country. We've already seen that the equation of the expenditure approach asks us to use the net exports figure, which is also known as the trade balance of a country. Put simply, if a country has a trade deficit, this means that the domestic economy is spending more on foreign goods and services, or that imports are higher than exports. In this case, the net exports are negative. A trade deficit in one country is equivalent to a trade surplus in another. It's a type of zero-sum game. A trade surplus, on the other hand, corresponds to higher exports compared to imports and to a positive net exports figure. On the graph, you can see the countries with the largest trade deficits and surpluses as of the end of 2010. Although total figures have changed since then, it is the relative trends we're interested in. Germany, for example, comes as number one in exporting goods. They are famous for their machines, vehicles, and pharmaceutical industry. The US, on the other side, had a $59.3 billion goods trade deficit which accounts for their huge imports of goods and services from all over the world. Perfect. This is how we calculate the GDP of a country using the expenditure approach. We'll compare it with the income approach in our next video.